Good evening, everyone. My name is Jara Pipkin, and I'm a communications specialist here at the American Angus Association. I'm excited to welcome you to the next webinar brought to you by Angus University, Making Sense of the Market. At any point throughout the webinar, you can ask a question to answer myself through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. To do so, hit Q&A, type in the chat box, and then hit send. We will be compiling the questions and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. This evening, you'll hear from one of Cattlefax's own, Lance Zimmerman, as he helps you separate markets from emotions. Lance will discuss the cattle cycle, cattle and beef supplies, demand trends, and provide a long-term market outlook. Lance was raised on a diversified crop and commercial cow-calf operation in Northwest Kansas. After graduating from Kansas State University with a bachelor's degree in agricultural communications and journalism, Lance worked for five years as a marketing manager for Certified Angus Beef. He then earned a master's degree in agricultural economics from K-State in December of 2010. Lance's primary responsibility is managing the Cattle Facts member database, as well as coordinating the organization's fundamental research and analysis for the cattle and competing protein markets. Lance and his wife, Andrea, live in St. George, Kansas with their children, Lawson and Macy. He enjoys helping on the family farming operation, showing his children the world, hunting, and working on vehicle and home improvement projects. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be in the office tonight. Gladly. The floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining in this evening. I know your personal time is always valuable, so taking the time to sit out, uh, take a chance to listen to a market outlook on a nice Tuesday evening uh, is something I don't take lightly. You're welcoming me, in, me into your businesses, into your homes, and so we'll get right to business. As Jara mentioned, um, today's discussion is titled Separating Markets from Emotion. And I think that's very pertinent today when we consider what we've all gone through since the pandemic. There's no shortage of emotions that exist today, obviously, in our lives, and the markets are no exception. If you've been in the cattle business for any amount of time, you realize very clearly how emotional uh, be, being in the cattle markets is. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna spend time tonight really exploring four main points. For starters, we're gonna review where the cattle industry is in this phase of the cattle cycle. Then we'll share where cattle and beef supplies are today and where we anticipate them to go over the next five years. We'll do a review on demand, talk about what happened since the pandemic, stimulus hits the economy, and then now inflation. And then lastly, we'll wrap up and talk about what all this means for your operations. We'll discuss the uncertainty that still exists in the 2022 cattle markets, the opportunity that we believe exists this year and going forward, and really help you chart a path going forward. So let's dig in. When we talk about emotions in the marketplace, I think this graph or this image really sums up things well. Now, all of you might be saying, well, of course, this cow looks confused and is contemplating life. She's Hereford. But as you look at it, I think the saying at the top makes a lot of sense. I don't know what this cow's going through, but I can relate. That's how a lot of us have felt about this market over the last two years, right? One disruption after another led to one continuous challenge. And so as we talk about the markets, I think one of the biggest things we could do is embrace the idea that markets have an emotional component to them. And this is one of my favorite graphs when we talk about what's going on in the markets, whether it's the cattle markets, the equity markets, the grain markets, every single market we deal with has an emotional component to it. And so as you look at this chart, you can see it starts with optimism on the left, it continues all the way through and ends with optimism on the far right. But there's a wide range of emotions in between. And what I like to say is you can understand where we are emotionally in the marketplace by paying attention to the chatter at the coffee shop, right? You all know what I'm talking about. That group of farmers and ranchers and other community members that get together once a week, they share war stories, they talk about what's going on in the marketplace, they talk about what's going on in their day-to-day -day lives, and you know exactly where the emotions are in the marketplace based on the rhetoric you're hearing at the coffee shop. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So first, what happens when you start to hear people get really excited about being involved in the cattle business? They talk about how great the investment is, right? You start to hear Joe the barber, who always comes into these meetings, talk about, hey, I got a little money on the side saved up. I'm thinking about slowing down. Maybe I'll buy a few cows, right? Then Joe gets in the business. Things start turning a little sour. He starts to get just a little anxious. And what does he do? Man, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I should get out of this investment. 
you know, hey, you sold me those 15 head. How about you buy them back from me for what I got in them, right? Then Joe gets out of the business, says he's done. He's washing his hands of it. He's not coming back. Well, what's interesting is when you hear those different points, those should be visual and audio cues for you, right? When somebody's sitting there and they're excited about getting into the business, you should recognize as a cattle producer, that's when you're at the point of maximum financial risk. That's when your assets, your cattle, your calves that you're selling are worth the most they could possibly be worth. That's when you need to be looking to sell it, right? Selling that calf crop early, locking in those futures prices early, hedging, doing anything you can to capture that price now while the asset's at its highest value level. Vice versa, when everybody's panicked, the market's cratered, that's the time of maximum financial opportunity. That's the time when those prices are at their lows and the best thing you can do is expand your operations, grow your inventory, build that value for the next cycle uptick. Now, as we think about the emotions in the marketplace, there's not just a cycle of market emotions that typically exists through just a calendar year and the normal seasonal patterns that exist in markets. There's also long run ones. And that's where the cattle cycle, we're gonna talk about a little bit later, will become even more important. But when we talk about emotions in particular, let's zero in on just what's hit us in the last two years. It actually really started even a little bit before that. If you look at the beginning of this timeline, it says very clearly August 2019, a major packing plant fire, right? We had that plant fire in Holcomb, Kansas that kind of kickstarted us off and we create a backlog of fed cattle and feed yards. Then, we had COVID-19 hit basically in April of 2020 for the packing industry, and then all the labor issues that ensued as the packing industry tried to rebuild its labor force. Then we had extreme winter storms that slowed down processing this past February. We had plant upgrades and maintenance. We had computer issues, and we just had one problem after another. Cyber attack, packing taking the first three-day holiday weekends they'd taken in decades. We had plant food safety issues, trucking issues, and most recently we had Omicron disrupt production. Every single one of these happened at the packing segment, but because of where we are at the cattle cycle with peak supplies in the cattle feeding industry, every single one of those caused a major headache for all cattle producers from cow calf all the way through the feeding segment. And so it leaves you to wonder what's next. Well, the good news is, as we talk about the other side of the cycle, not just from a supply standpoint, but from a price and value standpoint, we're going through what we would consider the bottom of the current cattle price cycle. Basically every 10 years, we go through a major high or a major low. The most current low that we're going through likely ended last year with the, the 2021 pandemic year. As we go forward to 2022 and probably all the way into 2025, we're gonna see our cattle numbers shrink, our beef production taper off, our per capita supplies tighten up and our pricing and opportunity for cattle producers improve. And so when you think about it from that perspective, we're going through that period where maximum financial opportunity has really existed for us over the last three years. It doesn't mean it hasn't come without challenges. It doesn't mean that it hasn't come without headaches and burdens, but as we go forward, being prepared for this next uptick in the cattle cycle is going to give you a great opportunity as cattlemen to take advantage of what we believe is a great opportunity in this next phase of the price cycle. The other thing to think about is we're really in the golden era of what we consider excellent beef demand. When we talk about this industry, and I think back to my time as a child going to cattle meetings with my father, a lot of the discussion was, how can we build demand? How can we grow demand? We keep losing market share. We keep losing value. That existed from the 80s all the way through the late 1990s. And when you look at this particular graph, you can see here very clearly from 1980 through 1998, we lost beef demand on average every single year through that period. Our total industry per head margin was 32 bucks. Every single segment in the industry from cow calf to packer had to fight for their share of $32 a head. From 1998 on, we've grown demand. And we're gonna talk more about that later in the discussion, but what we've done as we've accomplished that is we've built the average annual per head profit margin up to $260 a head. And now we're fighting for that among the four supply segments. 
And so as we talk about the opportunity that exists for us, as we build value in this next phase of the cycle, know that we're doing so at a much higher total value. So let's take a minute and let's talk about the supply side of this cattle and beef industry and what we think that means going forward. We obviously just had the January 1 USDA cattle inventory report come out at the end of last month. And it shocked all of us, even us at Cattle Facts, because the government not only reduced the 2022 number on January 1, which we largely expected, but they also revised the 2021 number lower than where it was reported the previous year. What does that mean to us? It means the contraction's a lot farther along than we ever would have imagined at this phase in the cattle cycle. It also means that based on the number of heifer retention that we're seeing right now among US cow herds and the culling rate that we've experienced lately, the prospects of drought going forward, we're likely to see a pretty significant reduction as we go into 2023, regardless of the situation we're in. It means that in all likelihood, the best case scenario is we bottom the cow herd from an inventory standpoint in 2024, but the risk is it may stretch into 2025. Supplies are tightening, and we're gonna work through that all the way through the beef industry now for these next couple of years going forward. One of the things I mentioned was drought. It continues to be a threat as we look at the US cow herd today. You can see through January, we're sitting there with some degree of drought affecting basically 70% of U.S. cow-calf operations today. Certainly an elevated level and something that should create pause for all of us, but it's a far cry from where we were in 2013 at this point. And what I mean by that is the severity is completely different. As we talk about the most extreme levels of drought and exceptional levels of drought, those bar segments were far worse in 2013 than they are today. So it's a risk factor that we need to watch. But what we need to hope for is not only can we draw this bar lower as we work through this year, but let's hope that we keep the intensity levels at a minimum and reduce those intensity levels in more areas going forward. And that's certainly something that we've seen as we navigated through the winter. As you look at this map today, what I would tell you is had we looked at it four months ago, as we got towards the end of summer, you would have seen a much more dramatic red and orange area through the area west of the Rockies. The winter weather conditions in that area have allowed considerable improvement in this area, but obviously still in major risk of drought going forward. The thing that concerns us as we look at this map today is we continue to see yellow and red stretch farther east on this map. And I circled these areas from North Dakota down to Texas for a very specific reason. As we just look at those states that line up from Texas to North Dakota, we're talking about 51% of the nation's cow herd residing in those states. If we wanna minimize the effects of drought and further cow herd contraction going forward, it's imperative that we get timely rains that allow this to pull back as we work through the rest of this winter and spring. Unfortunately, as we look at it today, some of those areas are gonna be continuing to see elusive weather patterns as we navigate through the spring. Our in-house meteorologists uh, continue to talk about pretty dire precipitation prospects as we work through that area of the country. Obviously, you know weather maps well enough. Dark red and orange are, are pretty dire situations, and that continues to affect us through the entire western half to third of the United States. We're going to see good rains through the southeast and even uh, the Corn Belt region through the spring, which is going to be great for spring planting, but a lot of cow country is still going to be struggling in those same areas where droughts affected them over the course of the last year. And so as we talk about the cow herd, just in summary relative to where inventories are expanding and contracting, as we came out of the 14 cow herd lows, we built our expansion on the Southern Plains, adding basically 1.4 million cows to the cow herd in those states focused in the South Central region of the United States. Those areas are obviously taking the biggest hit as we look at the contraction phase that's hitting us now with just 20, 250,000 head liquidation year over year in the South and in the Northern Plains, another 370,000 head year over year reduction. And so as we go forward, those are the areas we're watching the most. If we can get weather improvement there, we can stop some of the contraction that's been taking place. The other side of it is, even if we stop the cow herd contraction, we're in a situation where there's not a lot of herd replacements in the pipeline to come on board. 
We've already sent a lot of heifers into feed yards. Obviously, as you look at this data here, this is the percentage of heifers on feed across the US. We're keeping that number very elevated, very similar to levels and in fact, exceeding even levels that we saw back here in 08, 09, and 10, as we were going through the heart of the last contraction. We're gonna really need to start to see that number roll over as we work through the rest of 2022 to have hope that we can stem some of the recent contraction pressures we've seen in the nation's cow herd. And then of course, even though we hate to see the cow herd contract, we recognize the reasons that have led to it. Drought's a big factor. The lack of profitability is another major factor. The uncertainty and the volatility that's existed in the markets has contributed, as well as just demographic shifts, as we have an aging producer population, a growing urban population, an urban sprawl, and a variety of other factors. But what we know is as we go through contraction, the benefit is we tighten up the supply. And quite frankly, as we went through 17 and 18 and 19, and our calf crop peaked during this phase of the cattle cycle, we built a calf crop that we didn't have a packing industry big enough to accommodate. And that created a lot of the heartache that then we all went through as cattle producers through that period and into 21 and 2020 and 2021. As we go forward, we're gonna get that calf crop much more back in balance with the existing packing capacity and the cattle feeding capacity that supports it. And as we do so, that's gonna allow profitability and margins to trickle all the way back to the cow-calf segment. As we look at that, that obviously means that beef production is gonna tighten up as well. And the great news is even though beef production will probably meet its lows somewhere out here in 2025, if the cow herd lows are in 2024, we're predicting beef production to remain basically uh, a billion pounds above where it was at the lows back in 14 and 15. But as we go forward, everything follows a lag. As the cow herd declines, then the calf crop declines, and then the next year later, usually beef production declines. We would have seen the peak in beef production in 2020 had it not been for the pandemic. But instead, we pushed some of that additional supply to 2021, and essentially that delayed some of these market factors to signal their way all the way back to the cattle producer as fast as they normally would. And then ultimately, even though we have beef production at record highs in 2021, surprisingly, US beef consumption did not make new highs. And that's because we've continued to grow the demand for US beef globally. And we've seen more and more exports going to uh, take US beef to overseas markets. And so while beef production on a per capita basis made additional strides last year, knocking on the door of 59 pounds per person, uh, the trend is likely lower now as we work through this contraction phase of the cycle and likely realize per capita supplies that are actually a pound to a pound and a half below the lows that we would have been in clear back here in 14 and 15. So obviously those of you thinking ahead, you realize supplies are tighter than where we were in the previous cycle low demand has continued to grow, the likelihood is the price targets we set, not just for retail and wholesale beef prices, but also fat cattle, feeder cattle and calves is gonna to continue to grow. So it's great foreshadowing to the demand discussion we'll have next. Uh, when it comes to the best stories we have in the beef industry today, I'm really proud of the story we have in terms of how we've grown beef demand as an industry since those 1998 lows I mentioned earlier. And you can see it on the graph. Demand's really hard to measure. And so as you kind of digest this graph that I'm putting in front of you today, let's talk about demand versus supply. Supply is an easy number to understand for anyone because we can count it. Number of head, number of pounds, number of beef items consumed. Demand's a lot harder because it's not just the underlying value of that product, but it's the value of that product in light of how much of the production is existing in front of the consumer. And so what we do is we index this value. We basically borrow this index from academia and we set 1998, the demand lows as 100%. And so every single number on this index is representative of what the demand looks like relative to that 1998 base. For a long time, 04 represented the demand highs that we had seen since putting in those lows. 22% increase compared to where it was in 1998. Then the shine of the Atkins diet faded. We pushed more product into the domestic market as we had trade challenges. We had a recession and we saw demand only 2% higher at the recession lows in 2010. 
as we transitioned, we rebuilt demand into the 14, 15 highs, and we thought things were great. Little did we know the best was yet to come. As we came out of 2020, demand skyrocketed to 34% above those 1998 lows. This past year, we built on that even more. 41% demand increase since 1998. What does that mean? This demand is now the highest it's been in 30 years. And so as we think about the things that we do specifically in the Angus breed with the certified Angus beef program, the focus on marbling, cutability and the like, you've been direct contributors to this demand growth as an industry. But there's another side to the story, right? We all recognize inflation has been rampant and beef's not immune to that. And so it's really a reasonable question to ask, can demand continue to grow or how much of this is funny money at retail? We all recognize demand is crazy high right now. Energy, housing, and automobile costs are driving the bulk of the inflation growth today, where January inflation is up 7.5% relative to prices a year ago. What I'm here to tell you is beef demand can survive these inflation blows. And I'm going to talk about why as we dissect through this. One of the reasons we're seeing rampant inflation is obviously because we're a cash flush economy right now. All of that government stimulus is showing up in every single major economic data point. This is consumer spending versus savings. And every one of these big green bar spikes represents a spike in consumer savings. In other words, every time crazy Uncle Don and crazy Uncle Joe sent you a new check, you actually ended up as an American consumer putting 50% of it in your savings account. And we're trickling that money out into the economy slowly but surely today as we ease those pandemic-related restrictions. Likewise, what you'll notice on this graph is every time we see historically a spike in savings, eventually we see a spike in spending. And so that's exactly what we're going through today. The U.S. consumer put a lot of that pandemic stimulus money underneath their pillow cushions, underneath their couch cushions, saving it for a rainy day. And we keep seeing it slowly but surely bleed out. And it's not just the savings rate. We can also talk about lower interest rates. We can talk about home refinances. We could talk about trading up to better jobs with better wages. All of those factors work together in fueling a lot of the inflation issues we have today. So. Yes, we need to watch out, but it's not all bad news. First, government stimulus has loomed large since the pandemic. The consumer has money to spend, interest rates have fell, and now those big purchases have cheaper payments. In fact, you could argue that if you were a savvy consumer and refinanced a home you bought from 2017 to 2019 during the pandemic, your home payment may be as much as $300 a month cheaper for a 30-year mortgage. But what if those interest rates weren't fixed? What if you bought a new car on a variable rate loan? All of those asset purchases and the debt that's come with them may be suspect to changing if the Federal Reserve is at risk of raising inflation or raising interest rates. That would obviously squelch inflation, but it also has risk of unwinding some of the good things that have come in this economy through some of that stimulus. So that's one of the biggest risks that we see to demand going forward but right now we're in wait and see mode. One of the things that's interesting is the US consumer still needs to eat. And even as we've built quality of our product, we've not necessarily done a, a bad job of, of ratcheting up price to the US consumer. Yes, there's an uptrend. And this is basically the minutes the average US consumer has to work up for one pound of choice beef. And you can see there's a slight uptrend bias as we've grown demand from those 98 lows. But in light of things, we're still sitting here significantly lower in terms of the time involvement it takes to earn that pound of choice beef compared to where we were in the 90s. So yes, beef's expensive relative to a lot of the other items in the meat case, but it's not a, a limiting factor in most cases for the average American consumer. And even the argument that beef's expensive relative to competition is struggling to hold as much water today. This is ground beef relative to the price for a chicken breast and a boneless pork chop. And I put ground beef against these items for just a paradigm shift. If we think about beef being too expensive, 
Likely, if you're a buyer of fine steaks, you're always going to be a buyer of USDA Prime or certified Angus beef and the best steak cuts that money can buy. If you're the average US consumer and you're worried about beef price sensitivity, you're likely an everyday Joe, a middle income earner in America. You're more than likely leaning pretty heavily into a ground beef buy if you're gonna put beef in your grocery cart. More importantly, beef is roughly finding 60% of its consumption in the United States today from ground beef. And so it's a good proxy to just get a pulse on what everyday Americans think about price. Likewise, most consumers are buying chicken breast today. They're not cooking up whole fryers. They're not buying a whole plate of drumsticks or thighs. More often than not, we're a white meat society when it comes to, to our poultry. So the breast is king. And then the pork chop. Whether it's pork loins, whether it's pork chops, more often than not, that's the pork item we're going to consume. And what you'll notice is there's an uptrend that's existed in the premium for ground beef over these competing items. I could extend this graph all the way back to the 1980s and that premium would still exist. But what you notice is I get concerned when we get far outside of the uptrend. This certainly happened back here in 14 and 15 and beef paid for it dearly as we got way too expensive relative to pork and poultry in a short period of time. It happened briefly against the chicken breast at the heat of the pandemic. But really since then, beef's actually maintained a pretty competitive price, ground beef versus the competition. And so for us today, inflation's a concern, but inflation's more of a macro level concern. As we talk about beef prices relative to the competition, we feel beef's priced very favorably against those other items. More importantly, it's our belief that beef has demonstrated its value better to the US consumer. This is demand broke out by USDA choice and select on a wholesale basis. So this would include trade effects. Choice beef demand has grown 90% since 1998. Conversely, select demand has been nearly flat, only growing basically 10 percentage points over that entire period. And so, yes, beef has grown in its price point, but especially when you can produce higher quality product, the consumer has proven that it's worth it to them. And obviously, we've answered that call, and you at the Angus Association know this better than most. Uh, we're sitting here today talking about an industry that we've increased the volume of prime, CAB, and choice 60% since the lows back here in 05. Today, we constantly talk about 10 plus percent prime grading cattle, 24% upper two thirds choice. In 05, it was two and a half percent prime and 14% choice. And so as we navigate through this, we're answering the call. And the industry is clearly telling us higher quality is where the market's at. And then I'd be remiss to not talk about the global market. Exports were gangbusters in 2021. We saw exports increase 17% compared to a year ago. One of the strongest year over year growths in exports that we'd seen in over a decade. As we navigate this market going forward, we expect another 5% export growth again this next year. Imports, pretty flat, right at 3.4 million billion pounds. And so as we navigate and look at what that means, the biggest source of that increase today is China. You can see the increase on this graph right here with the orange line segment. China firmly moved their way to the third largest destination for US beef globally. We continue to see China, South Korea be great markets for US beef. While Japan, it's become much more of a maturing market for us stable incomes, less growth there, and honestly, a, a more aging demographic has made it a, a much more stable partner than it was through the early 2000s. So what does this all mean? I've talked a lot of big picture supply and demand moving fundamentals, but honestly, what does it mean at the pasture gate? Well, one thing I'm here to tell you is we go through ebbs and flows when it comes to are the markets moving most in the commodity markets, or are they moving most in the equities, like the S&P 500? We went through a boom over the last 10 plus years in the equity markets. The last big commodity boom we had was back here in 08, 09, and 10. 
And there's a lot of indications, whether you look at the energy markets, the grain markets, or the contraction that's gone on in the proteins, that coming out of the pandemic, we're at the start of the next big commodity cycle uptick. And so know that as we talk about what's going on in your own backyard, the greater commodity story is picking up steam. Yes, part of that's due to inflation, part of that's due to commodity related uh, pandemic production disruptions. But we really do feel that the commodity market is poised for its next big rally and equities will likely be the slower growth market over the next 10 years. As we talk about what that means, you can't look at the livestock industries without seeing the appreciation we've seen in the corn and soybean markets, right? We challenged 750 uh, per bushel earlier in the year. Uh, we're basically sitting here and looking at the next major point of resistance is back here as we look at prices that we saw at the end of 2012 and early 2013. And so as we look at it today, the first major resistance is in this upper $6 area, 675 to 680 on a futures price basis. Then we'll start looking towards those $7 price points. And the main reason we're seeing that today is because we're trying to preserve acres. Soybeans have been the explosive market. Just recently, last week, we took out the early highs. Now the next highs that stand in this soybean market are clear back here in that 12 and 13 period. We're gonna to continue to have volatility in the soybean market, basically because of outside factors. As we look at it, the global supply of beans is in tight supply with poor Brazilian and Argentina crop conditions. Our domestic supply is incredibly tight. There's exceptional demand from China right now for grain. Uh, and we also have a domestic push for more renewable diesel. All of those factors mean soybeans are in the driver's seat and all the other grain commodities, corn, spring wheat, and even hard red winter wheat are chasing it and trying to preserve their standing and their acreage and their carry out relative to what's going on in the soybean market. The other side of this global big picture commodity boom is the protein markets are tightening. Obviously we're not seeing it so much in the chicken market yet. They've been much more so a flat participant from a per capita supply standpoint. But look at what's happening to per capita pork consumption. We've had three consecutive years of decline and our expectation is we'll continue to see that in 2022. Obviously beef's gonna join this group along with the pork producers this next year if our forecast is accurate relative to beef per capita supplies. So in 2021, just for review, beef was the lone protein with an increase, up six tenths of a pound on per capita supply. Pork and poultry were each lower. And at the end of the year, we were just below steady, down four tenths of a pound for total US beef, pork and poultry consumption. As we flip the script to 2022, broiler is the lone item that's seeing an increase. Beef's leading the charge with the per capita decline. And in the end, we'll have nearly a three pound per capita reduction in total US protein supplies. And so clearly we're in a market that's in contraction, not just for beef, but tighter grain markets, tighter beef markets, tighter pork and poultry. Obviously we talked about the supply dynamic. It's not lost on any of us that our supplies outside of feed yards are getting tighter with the herd contraction we went through. Nearly a 700,000 head reduction in per cat, or in, sorry, in outside feeder cattle and calf supplies to start this year. But the other important message is as we went through the pandemic, Look at what we've done with the population of cattle that have been on feed for five months or more. It peaked as we shut down packing plants during the height of COVID in 2020. As we brought on all the placements that we backed up outside of feed yards, we peaked it again to start 2021. And now as we work through the start of 2022, we finally have a supply that's manageable of those basically market ready cattle in feed yards. It's no shock as we've put a downtrend in that on feed supply that's market ready, look what we've done to the fed cattle market. We took it from the pandemic lows at $95. And today, actually last week, I didn't get the graph updated. We traded fat cattle at 140 to slightly above 140 on a US average basis. The biggest reason why is we're getting that supply in balance with packing capacity. You can see the blue bars represent a five day work week in the packing industry and how many cattle they can kill on a weekly average basis. The red bar represents what our slaughter actually was. 
You may be asking, well, Lance, how could they kill more cattle than exist on a Monday through Friday basis through this period you're circling? We had to pay them. We took a hit in the cattle market because we had to pay the packer to work on Saturdays or to push just a little extra out of those Monday through Fridays. Look at what's happening as we transition to 2022. We're gonna get those red lines and those blue bars in balance. And by the time we get to 23, 24, and 25, increased packing capacity and tighter cattle supplies are gonna allow us to be back in the driver's seat, that there'll be more hooks available for cattle than there are actually finished cattle to harvest. The one challenge in all of this is still labor. You see the golden bars. Those are those capacity levels that have been lost due to COVID, due to labor challenges, due to other interventions that have just continually thwarted maximum efficiency at the packing plant level. We obviously still predict challenges just like we had in January to flare up. But as COVID gets farther and farther behind us, we believe we can fix some of those as an industry and grow that capacity going forward. The markets are anticipating that as well. One of the things that we talk about when we talk about the futures markets, even though they're traded in Chicago, even though they're paper, uh, they're anticipatory. And the futures market caught on to this wholeheartedly as we navigated through 2021. To the point that today, the cash market is slowly but surely trying to catch the carrot that is the futures market. This is an average 12 month out front futures price. That's what we call the strip. And you can see we're sitting here today knocking on the door of 145 to 150 trading range. As long as this strip finds support above 130, the math would suggest feeder cattle don't have risk below 150. Calves probably don't have much risk below 175. And that's if corn stays range bound. Obviously, we'll need this price to continue to escalate if we're gonna manage through a higher corn price environment going forward. The other side of it is profits trickle back down to the closest factor of production. Through the pandemic, we recognized the emotion that existed as retailers were making profits on beef, packing industry was making profit on beef, but it was elusive to the cattle producing segment. Today, we're seeing profitability in the cattle feeding segment. We've stretched together a very profitable fall and winter as a cattle feeding segment, and the futures markets are likely to give us a profit in the cattle feeding segment all the way through the spring and maybe even the early parts of summer. If the cattle feeding segment can gain confidence in their ability to make a profit, next will be the stalker operator, the background operator, and then ultimately the cow-calf guy. And then the other side of it is we're slowly seeing the transition in the on-feed market. February 1, cattle on feed supplies will likely be record large. Not record large for February, record large on history. As we transition through the spring, placements are going to tighten up. We drew in a ton of drought liquidated cattle through the fall and winter. As we transition to April, May, and June, we'll probably see a 400,000 head decline year over year in feedlot placements. We'll realize that with a tighter on feed population by the end of summer to fall. As we do that, feeder cattle prices will gain more support and the calf market will as well. And so today, the seasonal of the market suggests calf prices, they're gonna continue to ratchet to their spring highs. I would tell you I'd have all the confidence in the world a calf price is going to 220 if we had prospects of green grass through the Central Plains, that great grazing region through the Osage country and the Flint Hills of Kansas. But today, I think the drier weather conditions will probably undermine a bit of this spring calf rally. Today, my target's about 210. With green grass and better prospects for moisture, we can push it a little bit higher. And I think as we go out here to the fall lows, there's gonna be a world of support around 180 as we get out to October, November a totally different market than what existed over the last two years. But as we talk about raising calves, it's always important to remember, don't just focus on commodity production. One of the things we talk about at Cattle Facts often, and Angus producers are not immune to this at all, they recognize these signals very clearly, is that higher quality pays better dividends. And so as we talk about your market, commodity cattle are just these average cattle by the orange bar, but adding weaning, adding vaccination programs, 
adding on natural and premium uh, based management and verified breeding programs, doing age and source verification, and then ultimately having performance and carcass history continues to add to the price you get. And what's interesting is these premiums on the left, two to $5 a hundred weight, one to $8 a hundred weight, they're not static. As the market increases in value, these premiums increase by equal proportion. And so no, as the market starts moving higher, so are the differential price premiums that exist with these underlying market values. And so as we think about raising cattle, one of the best things we can do is start thinking about what other options exist outside of the production segment we're in today. There's a lot of things you can do with a five weight calf weaned in the fall. 70% of the industry weans calves in the fall. So I thought this was a very pertinent example. We can dry lot them, turn them to summer grass, run them through a feedlot. We can take them to a preconditioning program and right to a feedlot or take them onto a winter grazing program. Or ultimately we can just background them and take them right to that feed yard and move on. As we think about that, it's important to keep in mind what these grain prices are doing and what your feed costs and your labor situation is at home. As we think about that October weaned five weight and just adding value to it into February as an eight weight, look at what the market's added for value since the 2010 year. On average, $284 a head. As we look specifically to this year, it was $400 a head. The higher the underlying corn price, the tighter the availability of bunk spaces in feedlot country, the better this premium is. And as we look at it today, I think going forward, being strategic about the time periods when you decide to sell those calves in October versus retaining ownership on through the backgrounding, grazing, or even finishing stage, making judicious decisions that when you can add more value to your ranch will really be beneficial to you in this phase of the cattle cycle. But know that anytime you extend ownership, you inherently add production risk to your operation. And as we talk about that eight weight calf, I would tell you today, these feeder cattle prices would fully be $10 higher if we had more capacity available to us in the feeding segment. The inn is full, so to speak, right now. But as we transition out into this July, August, September period, and those cattle on feed supplies tighten significantly relative to last year, we're gonna see an explosive feeder market in that window. Probably actually off of this graph and upwards of 180 uh, for a price point around Labor Day. And then cyclically, know that on average, over the next five years, you're gonna sell into a market the next year at higher lows and higher highs. Every single time we've gone through one of these cyclical periods of steep and growing supplies, we've bottomed the market. That happened to us from 19 to 2021. As we go forward, you can see we expect this calf market by the midpoint of this decade to approach $270, $280 a hundredweight for those wean calves. What it means is if you thought about expanding your operation, mother nature hasn't punished you with drought, the cheapest cows you can buy are likely the cows you buy today. You can see the value of the cow follows, follows roughly the value of the fat animal. As we talk specifically to the value of the weaned calf, over time, it takes one and a half calf crops to pay for that next cow. During the peak of the last market in 2020, we leaned into some tight bred cow supplies and that calf market bottomed because of the pandemic. So I don't think this is necessarily a great proxy, but I do lean on this one. Back here in 2017, the average value of that cow was nearly 1.8 times the value of the calf crop. So what does that mean for your operation? Well, if you wait all the way out to 2025 and that calf market's at 265 100 weight, a 1.65 ratio against that $1,400.50 per head price is a $2,400 bred cow on the average. Increase that a tenth of a point on that ratio and you add another $100 to that bred cow price. And again, these are just average cows. We certainly know that when you start adding the premiums, the genetics, the higher end female characteristics into the auction description, that value could easily increase $500 to $1,000 a head. And so, as we think about what you're doing, don't just add cows for cow's sake. 
Recognize the fact that you're producing a higher quality product today. And I think this is very telling. This is fed cattle premiums based on grade. Yes, producing over 80% choice has been somewhat of a, a flat uptrend since the lows in 18. But look at what the market's done if you failed to produce high levels of choice cattle. Discounts of nearly $60 a head and growing. The market expectation today is to choose high quality beef and it trickles all the way down to your selection. And so know that your best chance to buy high quality female genetics is on the front end of this cycle, not five years from now. And so in summary, the cattle cycle. Cattle producers are reducing their herd size and we know the reasons why. Lower prices, more uncertainty, tighter margins and drought. Then there's the supply side of the discussion. As we go through that phase in the cattle cycle, cattle and beef supplies are obviously declining and that's increasingly supportive to the prices that we are seeing. And it's going to continue to get better on average each and every year. There's still some capacity bottlenecks. Feed yards are full, packing plants are still having challenges, but that'll take some time to fix. And we think that time is coming. Demand. U.S. consumers and global consumers are pretty unified in the idea that they're willing to pay for higher quality beef. And from that standpoint, U.S. producers are in the driver's seat as the number one producer of grain-fed beef in the world. As we look going forward, could, change, could that change as costs escalate? Certainly. But we think the inflation concerns are a much bigger macro-level economic risk than they are specific to beef today. And then I just wanna end this discussion with a little bit of what I alluded to towards the end as we think about the prospects of herd expansion should this drought ever dissipate. Know that every one of your operations needs a plan. I'm sure whether it's your neighbors, your extension economist, your sale barn operator, or your banker, everybody's told you the importance of having a plan. That's what separates out the top 25% of producers from the bottom 25%. Know your plan and work your plan. At Cattle Facts, we use this saying that an error in execution is more serious than an error in judgment. And what we mean by that is don't mess up your plan. Get the execution right. You're gonna have to make judgment calls from time to time. We do as analysts. And sometimes our judgment calls are wrong and we accept that, but we move forward from them. If you deviate from your plan, that's a much more serious error. And so know that commodity prices are gonna be volatile. Know that markets are gonna to continue to be pretty emotional as we navigate through some of these headwinds. But check your emotions at the door, lean on your plan, and we'll talk about all your successes the next time we get together. Jara, happy to turn it back over to you and hear what questions the audience has. Thank you, Lance, great presentation. We have some great questions submitted by our audience. And of course, we'll do our best to get through as many of those as we can before our time is up for the evening. All right. So if you ask a question and it doesn't happen to be answered in this broadcast, please reach out to Lance or myself and we'll be in touch in the coming days with an answer to your question. Well, it looks like our first question here, uh, pretty general to start things off, but one question we had from the audience, what do you feel like is the greatest opportunity for cow-calf operators to add value to their calf crop looking forward to the ah, market? That's a great question. You know, as we look at what we've been able to do as an industry, as I mentioned early in the discussion, uh, the ability we've had as U.S. beef producers to grow demand has honestly coincided almost perfectly with giving the consumer more high quality product. And so that's almost a cop-out answer talking to a group of Angus producers. <laughs> But I would tell you, continue to invest in business practices and management practices from genetics to nutrition to health that add value to your consumer. And that starts first by asking the buyer your calves, you know, your feedlot operator, your background or your stalker operator, what do you like? What am I doing right? What can I fix? And then you got to take that information and go back to your ranch. You know, I shared those stair steps to profitability. And one of the things I've neglected to mention there um, is not all of those stair steps are going to work for every producer. You need to take that information from your customer and then figure out, okay, can I achieve what they want, but do it profitably? When you think about the average cow-calf producer in the U.S., we're talking about 50 head per operation. 
that doesn't allow you much flexibility from a labor standpoint, or even sometimes a facility standpoint to do some of the little things that can add some pretty good incremental value. So always listen to your customer and then evaluate against the cost it would take to achieve that goal. Absolutely. I think we're definitely in a time that there's no shortage for quality, right? So Absolutely. we just need to make the decision that's best for our operation and the best for all of us moving forward. Yep, I agree. Next question is kind of a basic economic question, I guess, but many of us in our adult lives have never dealt with this kind of inflationary period, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice from a general business standpoint? Um, this particular person said, for example, do you think if you think something's overpriced, should you wait thinking it will get less expensive? Or do things ever really return to normal pricing as we've known it? <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. In fact, um, my brother's managing the family operation today, and we were uh, driving over here to St. Joe and having a conversation about fertilizer costs and herbicide costs, uh, especially with the news that uh, Roundup is going to be an incredibly tight supply. Mm -hmm. And every single decision we make on the home operation, my brother's consistently benchmarking it against what is his break even? What's the current market price? And so today we're in a situation where at least in this example, talking about grain, our grain prices are going up enough that even with fertilizer costs that are four and five times what they were a year ago, with herbicide costs that are three to four times what they were a year ago, you can still pencil some of those things out and make great money. But the catch is what happens when the markets turn over? And so what you have to do in these situations is recognize Yes, higher prices for inputs mean that you're extending your production risk as an operator. So make sure that as you do that, you also look at equal opportunities to offset your price risk on the sales side. How can you forward contract calves? How can you perhaps use futures or options contracts? How can you use livestock risk protection from the government to lock in some of those prices so that should the market turn and roll over the other way, you're not sitting here footing that entire bill. You've got some of your assets already sold that make these price points work. So you got to do a lot of pencil work, write out on spreadsheets, do some back napkin calculations, make sure that as you pay those prices, you have a plan working forward and how you're going to protect your sales price going forward to cover them. Absolutely. So with that in mind, you definitely think risk protection, risk management will play a big role in that. It has been something that helped our industry survive most of the last three years and a lot of this turmoil we went through. And it's going to become increasingly important going forward. Uh, a great example is had a producer, a longtime producer I talked to in the Flint Hills, and he talked about renewing his um, rain insurance for the next year. And I said, really, how, do, how does that drought rain insurance product work? I said, does, do you really make money on that? And he said, actually, he said, when I don't is when I get out of it. But what I figured out is over the long run, if I stay in that product for 10 years, I can, I can make out okay that the premiums I spend in years where grass is lush, far more make up for it on the backside when we're going through the drought we have been lately. But he said, you got to be able to go through that entire cyclical period for it actually to be a benefit to my operation. It's a great little learning tool for us to realize just because it didn't work in year one doesn't mean it won't work in year two, three or four. Absolutely. Just while we're on that subject, would you have any recommendations for people on how they could get more information about risk management yeah. or? No, that's a great question. Um, Cattle Facts, we pride ourselves in helping our members actually with that risk management side of the equation. We're not brokers. We actually are a nonprofit producer owned member organization. And so um, if they're not Cattle Facts members, give us a call. We can get you signed up, get you signed up for our newsletter products. First is what my always, my, what my always, my first recommendation is. And then if you're liking the things that we're sharing in our printed newsletters and email communications, then the next step is increase that membership so you can call an analyst, talk to them, get their opinion on the markets, how to execute some of those risk management strategies. And we actually have in the summer, in both June and September, uh, a risk management seminar that we offer for producers in our Denver office. Great. Thank you. We appreciate that. I know that livestock producers don't always have access to the most up-to-date risk management tools because we're not familiar with them. So Absolutely. it's definitely an uncharted territory for us that we'll be needing to look at in the near future, it seems like. So next question we have here, do you see more cattle being sold on the grid versus by the pound in the near future? Or what does that market outlook look like? That is a great question. We actually 
uh, have seen a long run increase in formula and grid pricing arrangements in this industry over the last 20 plus years. And there's a variety of confluence of factors as to why. One, um, we've improved the quality of cattle we have. We obviously, as an industry, have gotten better at managing our cattle to hit those higher quality targets. And feed yards today practically just bank on those additional 50 to 100 to $150 per head when they're actually paying the producer the price for those cattle and bringing them into the feed yard. And so, yes, that's going to, that has grown. I think we're probably reaching a point where we maybe we've plateaued um, just because we do need participation in the cash market, the commodity market to kind of set the floor and, and know what average is. But I do think as an industry, we've gotten a lot more comfortable with those programs. And it's a testament to the pricing structures that exist that we can have confidence in the market and then understand the value appreciation that comes from it. Um, there's challenges, obviously, politically uh, that exist with some of these agreements, but we think it's something that our industry has been built on. Uh, we're an industry that thrives on market differentiation and producing for different consumer groups and quality points. And those grids really allow us to do that efficiently as an industry. Absolutely. I think that definitely plays to what we do as Angus producers too, right? Just being able to hedge our markets as best as we know possible. Exactly. What effect do you think the global turmoil will have on USB? Huh. <laughs> Actually, while we were eating dinner tonight, right <laughs> ahead of this, I was reading about the conflict in Ukraine some more and educating myself on that. Um, what's interesting about what we're seeing dominating news headlines today um, is I think it's going to have a lot more of an effect on the grain markets and probably the energy markets because uh, that's what's sensitive to that Ukraine region. The Ukraine region is one of the top 10 global exporters uh, when it comes to corn and beans, they're very important from a port access standpoint for Russia. Uh, and geopolitically, Russia is very involved in the energy markets and being a main energy exporter to Europe. And so as we talk about the direct impact, it's gonna be much more so on grains, much more so on energies. Could there be some trickle down effects to the protein markets? Possibly, but only indirectly and probably only temporarily. Uh, where I think some of the other issues are probably a little bit more long-standing and going to continue to create some volatility that we'll need to monitor. Absolutely. On the topic of energy, the next question that came through is definitely related to that. What strategies do you recommend to manage those input costs from en energy to feed as we see mm -hmm. those commodity prices mm -hmm. rise? One of the things, literally, again, relating to earlier today, talking to my brother, we were talking about energy prices. One of the things the folks on this call should, should keep in mind is that we talk about seasonal years. In the cattle market, a seasonal year for calves is obviously a high in the spring and a low in the fall because 70% of us sell calves in the fall. We don't have as many to sell in the spring when green grass is lush. Uh, the energy markets have a pretty well-defined seasonal too. About eight out of every 10 years as a producer, as a user of diesel and gas, uh, you're going to be better off hedging and trying to lock in long run contracts in the first quarter. Usually the very first part of the year, start calling your providers, start looking for those long run contracts. You have these global turmoil things that exist and throw chaos into that here and there. But I think even this year, it may rain true that guys who got those prices locked in early in January and February might be the winners by the time we get done with the end of the year. So specifically to energy, Focus on the winter months to do your work to lock in those prices for the rest of the year. On the hay side, um, that's always a precarious situation because you have the global market and specifically one of the biggest consuming units for forage is the dairy industry with high quality alfalfa. A lot of the dairy industry is focused in the West. You guys are fighting sky high forage and feed prices there. Where you transition that and look more right here where we're located in St. Joe, a lot of producers in Kansas, Oklahoma even, and certainly Missouri had pretty timely rains throughout the course of the last year, which allowed them actually have a pretty abundant hay supply. But we have drought that's reaching farther and farther into this area. So if you're in an area that had good production in the last year, right in the peak of the demand period now, be looking ahead to seeing even if you can buy some stuff that may be old harvest hay, get some inventory around you if you think there's risk of your drought deepening as we work through this calendar year. Absolutely. I think the moral of the story that I've heard tonight is definitely just to plan and just to plan. be forthcoming in everything that you have going on because you never know what's going to change. Yeah. It looks like the last question for the evening that just came in. Um, 
what do you see as the next wave of demand drivers? What needs to be on the horizon to keep consumers buying our product? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that we're keeping an eye on today uh, that we all are trying to kind of keep an eye on and understand is sustainability and how we communicate what we're doing with the consumer. I mean, that has been a, a challenge for this industry for decades. Um, but what's unique is I think we have a couple of tools at our disposal. One, we have a massive amount of generational transfer happening on farms and ranches across the U.S. today. And what's great is it's a lot of people our age and younger that are coming back to these operations, running them and managing them. And what's interesting is unlike our fathers and grandfathers and grandmas and moms before us, um, we didn't go to school with kids that now are still on the farm and ranch. You know, we went to college with people who are in a metro area and they're um, you know, working a day job in Kansas City or Denver or wherever it is. Um, we're going to soccer matches and church events with people who are largely not beef producers and we can tell that story to them. And we also are connected to them on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all these different mediums where we can better relate to them. But even on a tactical level, technology exists. We all talk about Bitcoin and I can't predict where Bitcoin's going to go, but the technology behind Bitcoin, blockchain check technology will not only help us tell the story, but they'll help back the story up because there's a data infrastructure that exists there, a traceability infrastructure that exists there, where consumers will have much more transparency about what we're doing with the cattle we raise and how it ultimately becomes the beef on their plate. And so I think we're seeing an escalation in, um, we're doing all these great things from a management practice standpoint and a story standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I think the technology is gonna allow those things to marry. And I think we don't even know where that's going yet with this whole sustainability discussion, but I think it's moving a lot faster behind the scenes than maybe we all realize as cattle producers. Absolutely, I agree. I think there's an untapped potential for us to be able to share our story, but also take advantage of that technology that we have at our fingertips that maybe generations ahead of us were inept or hesitant to use. And I think but we know the consumer better than maybe previous generations of producers absolutely. because we spent time with them in high school, in college and the like, so. Absolutely, the marketplace has totally shifted from where it was 25 years ago, per exactly. se. So, well, Lance, thank you. That was a great Q&A session. Uh, if you asked a question and it didn't get answered in this broadcast, please reach out to Lance or myself. Uh, his contact information will be uh, on the next slide and will be available for you to see. We'll be right back here on March 29th as we cover your common questions about contemporary groups. Join us to learn more. You can sign up live on the Angus University website at angusuniversity.com. On behalf of the staff here at Angus University, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for making sense of the market. Have a great night.